thanking you, Brother Neil Powlett, for those kind remarks. Appreciate those who are visiting with us in spite of the weather, but God gives all of the weather, regardless of what it is. But we thank you for being here in spite of the weather and also on this voting day. And we trust that you do that. I have found that division is rampant in the Lord's church. I regret very much that in the Lord's church there are tensions, schisms, doctrinal issues among the children of God. And because of these doctrinal issues, we do not have time enough to proclaim the word of God as it should be proclaimed to a lost and dying world because we have to deal with minor issues. It is most embarrassing. It is most regretful when people say, Mr. Burden, I appreciate you wanting to teach me this class from God's word. But I want you to know that you people in the Church of Christ need to get yourselves straight first. And then you can come and teach me. Why should I go into an organization that has a lot of divisions when I can stay right where I am and be comfortable with the divisions that we have. I thank the brethren for the subject. Avoiding division in the local church. From Titus chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. We know that there were many divisions in the Lord's church during Paul's day. Divisions dealing with marriage. Divisions dealing with moral disorders. Food offered to idols. The Lord's Supper and veiling of women. This division dealing with marriage is no different then as it is today. We have basically that same kind of division. But the Apostle Paul realized that they had division. We have division today because Satan is busy. Satan is doing the job that he wants to do, and that is to disrupt the Christian's activities. At that time, the entire world was seared and scarred by division, which separated men from men and individuals from each other. It was into this kind of a situation that the gospel came with its appeal to the people of the earth. It was into this kind of a situation that Titus, a Gentile convert, and Paul's true child in the common faith proclaimed his admonishing words to the Christians in Crete about false 
teachers. Titles chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. But beginning in Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, we find that the Apostle Paul, talking to Titus, told Titus to remind his people to obey the government, to obey the government and its officials, to be obedient and ready for any honest work. Paul told Titus to tell the people, do not speak evil of anyone. Do not perform a lot of quarreling, but be gentle and truly courteous to all. Paul told Titus to tell the people that because of God's kindness, because of God's pity, we have been saved by the washing away of our sins through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And in verse 8, the Apostle Paul told Titus, saying, these things, what these things, the things that he mentioned in verses 1 through 7, he said, these things I have told you are all true. Insist on them so that Christians will be careful to do good deeds all the time. For this is not only right, but it brings results. We find also in verse 9 that uh, Paul told Titus, don't get involved in arguing over unanswerable questions. Don't get involved in controversial theological ideals, but I want you to keep out of arguments. Tell the people to keep out of arguments, and not only to keep out of arguments, but keep out of quarrels about obedience to Jewish laws, for this kind of thing isn't worthwhile. It only does harm. So it is with us. We sometimes need to keep, we sometimes need to avoid foolish questions. We need to keep out of arguments over unanswerable questions. We need to keep away from controversial questions and the like in order that we might be able to proclaim God's words peacefully. In verse 10, he talks about a certain man. He said, a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. So the question is now, what and who is a heretic? A heretic is one we know who should be rejected. Paul calls him a factious man. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 19, he deals with that. But what is a factious man? What is a heretic? A factious mind is a jealous individual. A factious mind is an ambitious individual. A factious mind is a self-seeker. He is one who willfully chooses for himself and sets up a faction, or he sets up a division. He is also a divisible person who might say all carpets in the church building should be gold. That's a factuous individual. And not only that, he might say that the church building should be painted white to display purity. That's a factuous person. I met that sort of person when I was in California. We were trying to make a decision on what color we should paint the building. 
and a lady in the congregation said, we need to paint the building white. One person said, no, we need to paint the building brown. Another person gave another color. And you know that situation was very contentious. A lot of strife was involved over what color we were going to paint the building. I can only recall, even at that same time, there was much controversy over what you were going to place over top of the communion trays and the fruit of the vine. We had so much problems at that time about the cover that we were going to place over these items. And sometimes the cover was badly arranged. Sometimes the cover was soiled. But we could not decide, even in the business meeting, what are we going to do about that cover over the Lord's table? Are we going to remove it? Are we going to let it stay there? This is the factual individual. The factual individual is the one who forsakes the truth as it is in Christ Jesus. He broaches false doctrine. He forsakes the truth as it is in Jesus Christ. He breaks the peace of the church. An example of that is in 2 John 9 through 10. In 2 John, John tells us that whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he have both the Father and the Son. And John continues in verse 10 by saying, If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For if you bid him God's speed, then you are a partaker of his evil deeds. Toward the factuous individual, toward the hectic individual, the heretic individual, we have a responsibility to reprimand such a person twice. Then avoid or reject him if that individual does not change. Then there are two questions that we need to ask. Why should we avoid division? And how to avoid division? Why should we avoid division? We should avoid division because it is sinful. We should avoid division because it hinders the growth of a church. First of all, we should avoid division because it is sinful. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verses 10, the apostle Paul said to the Corinthians, Now I beseech you, now I beg you, you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all, every one of you, speak the same thing. And that there be no, you know, there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and also in the same judgment. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verses 1 through 3, the Apostle Paul says, I can't speak unto you as unto spiritual. I have to feed you even with milk. I can't feed you with meat because you're not able to bear it. But he says, I can't speak unto you as unto spiritual, for you are yet carnal. You are fleshly minded. You are worldly minded. And when you have among yourselves envying, when you have among yourselves strife, when you have among yourselves divisions, you are carnal walking 
as men. We need to avoid division in order to protect the church. Romans chapter 16 and verse 17. The apostle Paul said, now, brethren, I beseech you that you mock them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and I want you to avoid them. Question number two, how to keep or how to avoid division in the local church. <coughs> Looking at the subject again, avoiding division in the local church. Now we need to know how to avoid division in the local church. In order, in order to sustain spiritually, numerically, in order to win souls for Christ by proclaiming his truth to a lost and dying world, it is imperative, it is important that there be no divisions in the local church. The Bible teaches that Jesus prayed for unity of his disciples in John chapter 17 verses 1 through 28. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Psalms 133 and verse 1. And the fact that we are all Christ, or that we are all in Christ rather, we must endeavor to keep each of us in a state of unity. For no one can walk in disunity with his fellow man and in unity with Christ. If a man has Christ as the companion of his way, he is inevitably the companions of every fellow wayfarer. No man can live in this atmosphere of Christ and at the same time live in bitterness with his fellow man. Again I say, no man can at the same time live in the atmosphere of Christ and then at the same time live in bitterness with his fellow man. That cannot be. How to avoid division in the local church? We need to forget those things that are behind us which have created divisions. We need to think as Paul thought in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13. He says, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before us. Some things we need to forget. There are things that we need to kill there are things we need to destroy. We need to kill self-centeredness. We need to kill private desires. We need to kill private ambitions and everything which would keep one from fulfilling and obeying God and surrendering himself to Jesus Christ. Not only that, but the power of Christian love will enable us to avoid divisions. The power now, the power of Christian love will enable us to avoid distractions or divisions. Christian love enables us to have the same love one toward another. Christian love enables us to be of the same mind. 
Christian love enables us to esteem others better than ourselves. This Christian love will keep us in unity with each other. It is that unconquered benevolence and goodwill which will never know bitterness and which will only seek the good of others. Sometimes we say to each other, I love you. Sometimes we sing that song, I will love you with the love of the Lord. But are we really being truthful? I don't think sometimes we are being truthful. Because when, when we get down to, to the nitty gritty of things, then some of that love is lost. We say that we love individuals, but when they get into our presence, we find that the love is not there. Then we become, as James puts it, we are individuals who separate people one from the other. But nevertheless, love for each other does not mean loving only those who love us. That's what happens sometimes. If you love me, then I will love you. A person who does you harm, a person who dislikes you, you are supposed to love that person. So it does not mean loving only those who love us or those whom we like or those who are lovable. It means the power to love the people we dislike. We need to love those who hate us, the unlovable and the unlovely. Luke chapter 6 and verse 32. He tells us about that. And he says, or Jesus says in so many words, if you love people because they love you, then where is your reward. Sinners do the same thing. To prove your love, you really need to love those people who hate you. You need to love those people whom you have a dislike to. It's almost like inviting people out for dinner. We sometimes invite those people out to dinner because we know them. It's because we like them. But what about the person who has nothing? That's the person you need to invite out for dinner because they have nothing. What about the person who dislikes you with a passion? That's the person you need to love more because it's God's will that you do that so that you can be adequately rewarded. We need to know Satan and his devices. We find in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 that Peter is as a roaring lion seeking those whom he may devour. But he's not just as a roaring lion, but he's doing something he is walking about, and he is seeking those whom he may devour. We need to maintain a knowledge of the Bible, Hosea 4 and 6. And as we maintain this knowledge, we need to have the courage to stand upon it. It is not always going outside of New Testament doctrine that causes divisions, but making laws and binding them upon man that God did not make. Let me say it another way. In the Lord's church, 
We are not always divided over what's in the book. We are sometimes divided over what's not in the book. And we fight over those things that are not in the book compared to what's in the book. These things causes divisions. But ministers must teach good and useful things, but shun and oppose that which would corrupt the faith and hinder godliness and good works. We need to maintain the right attitude, obedience, and respect for the leadership because they keep watch over our souls. How is it that so many people disregard what the leadership has to say? And they say to themselves, I'm going to do what I want to do, regardless of what the leadership says, because when you look at the contribution, I am the one who put the most in the collection plate. And without my money is, this church will perish. So they need me. Therefore, they better listen to what I have to say. And that causes divisions. We need to obey the leadership so that their work will be a joy and not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. Hebrews 13 and 17. The evangelist and author Leroy Brownlow had this to say about church division. He had this to say in order to let the church know about the urgent needs that are needed in the Lord's church, which will help avoid division in the local congregation. He says, more sound heads and fewer sore heads. We need more sound heads and fewer sore heads. Perhaps there has never been a time in the history of the church in which we have a greater need for men sound in the faith, he says, and wise in judgment. We need men who are sound in the faith wise in judgment. Sometimes the voice of the wise goes unheeded, and then the voice of the foolish takes over. He said we need more open hearts <clears throat> and fewer open mouths. More open hearts and fewer open mouths, because all conduct proceeds from the heart. Prejudice closes the heart to a true consideration of the facts. If the heart was made right before the mouth was open, <clears throat> let me repeat that. If the heart was made right before the mouth was opened, most church problems locally and universally would cease to exist. He said, we need more seed slinging and less mud slinging. The task of sowing the seed of the kingdom is so great that it should leave no time for slinging of mud at a brother. The fact that we have the whole world as our foe would draw us closer together 
There should be, and I repeat, there should be no division in the Lord's camp. In conclusion, one can never whitewash himself by slinging mud at another. He who tries gets his own hands dirty when you try slinging mud at someone else. The question is, can we avoid church division except we agree? If we agree, then we can avoid church, di church division. But if we disagree, then Lord forbid there will be church division. Because of church division, I have seen in my lifetime old soldiers of the cross separated from each other because of church division. People who have been in the Lord's church for years, who have known each other for years, they separated themselves because they could not agree on certain issues. I feel like James in James 3 and 10 when he says, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. But I have seen local congregations separated from each other. Christian friends, we are divided. At times we are divided. No wonder the Apostle Paul told Titus, don't get involved, but avoid silly questions. Avoid strivings about the law because they are unprofitable and vain. They generate divisions. They are far from instruction and building up in godliness. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 2, the Apostle Paul said, There can be no happiness as long as he know that division lies within the Philippian church. Christian friends, there can be no happiness in any local congregation as long as division lies therein. There will be no happiness in the local church when division is not avoided. May God bless you this morning. The lesson is yours.